holiday break, enjoyed some time with the family. So here we are, January 13th. Uh, welcome downtown action committee meeting. And I suppose we should start with a roll call. If, uh, I don't know if that's Hope or Stacy. Roger Jansen. Present. Nick Mihilich. Present. Brian Chekis. Present. Stephen Graham. Present. Michael Cuevas. Present. John Lee Dizon. Let the record reflect that John Lee Dizon is not present. Brad McPherson. Present. Gregory Gabriel. Let the record reflect that Gregory Gabriel is not present. Okay, thanks, Hope. I guess um, I want we go ahead and do item two, the approval of the minutes from December 9th hearing. Does anyone have any comments or corrections or notations for that? Or motion to approve? Motion to approve. All right, second? Second. second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No, all right. Um, December 9th, the uh, minutes are approved. Um, Ed Hope, just a question. At what point do we need to read that uh, standard protocol letter for uh, the Zoom meetings? I'm sorry. Give me just a sec. Okay, thanks. I, if you could do that, that would be fantastic. Pursuant to Mayor Keith A. James's executive order number 2005, I'm sorry, 2020-05 issued on April 2nd, 2020, the city of West Palm Beach's boards and committees are conducting meetings through media technology and re have released the requirements to have a quorum of its members physically present at city hall. On April 14, 2020, Mayor Keith A. James's executive issued executive order number 2020-09, which specifically provides the rules of procedure for conducting city meetings, including requirements for quasi-judicial hearings. To ensure the ability for the public to continue to participate in this hearing, it is being streamed live and available for viewing in the city commission chambers located at city center 401 Clamato Street on the condition that social distancing be practiced. Additionally, for those wishing to access the meeting remotely, they are able to do so directly through the applicable Zoom webinar link, as well as the city's usual media channels, including WPB TV 18, the city's website, and the city's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. Anyone from the public who would like to provide comment on an agenda item is able to do so through the following. Number one, in the city center, Blacker Gallery, number two, by dialing 561-320-6451 and leaving a voicemail not to exceed three minutes, leaving an email or video recording to that public comment at wpb.org or completing the online public comment form at www.wpb.org forward slash public comments. Those accessing the meeting directly through Zoom also may use the Q&A or raise hand features. Anyone accessing just the Zoom audio using their phone may raise their hand by pressing star nine. Regardless of method, please be sure to indicate the agenda number or case number for which you are providing comment. Everyone providing testimony must have video capability and will need to be sworn in. The swearing in will occur at the start of each case on the agenda. If you are about to provide testimony or were not sworn in, please be sure to indicate such and be sworn before offering your testimony. After the applicant presents their case, staff will provide a presentation and then the public will have an opportunity to speak or have their comments read into the record from previously received correspondence. The board will then go into executive session. Prior to rendering a decision, the board will confirm no additional public comments have been received by staff. And finally, for the members of the board, it is emphasized that Florida Sunshine Laws are applicable and you may not use the chat feature or any other form of individual communication to discuss matters with other board members, 
the applicant or the general public during the meeting. Thank you, Hope. Okay, perfect. Now we'll go on to item three, report from City Urban Designer, Ms. Aponte. Good morning, um, board members. Uh, happy New Year to everybody. We're happy to start the new year with new projects. Uh, the downtown keeps moving forward and nothing has to stop despite the whole pandemic. So we keep moving forward, moving forward, new projects and new things that you will see in the next uh, month, say this month. Uh, that's all I have to report for today. Perfect. Okay. Let's uh, move on down to item five. Declaration of ex parte communication. Any board members have any to declare today on either case? Nope. Okay, so no, noted there's no ex parte communication. I right, move into item six, public hearing portion. Um, I think we'll swear in speakers before each case. So we'll go ahead and move forward into new cases. DAC case 20-09, request by Harvey E. Ora. And if we could kindly have the presentation. Harvey, before you start, will you and anyone who's going to speak on that case, turn your cameras on and raise your right hand to be sworn in. You swear from the testimony you're going to give today is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Would you like us to begin? Yes, Harvey, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, I am delighted to and very proud to bring this project before DAC, uh, hopefully for approval, because this it, it represents, to my best knowledge, the first significant private development mm -hmm. in the Northwest District in, in my lifetime. Uh, there's been a lot of public investment there, uh, but uh, really no, no private investment. And this is a significant project. Um, I think we should start out, I'll give you a roadmap. I'm going to ask my client, the developer, to first introduce himself and explain why he has chosen to make a $70 million plus investment in a neighborhood that no one else has invested in in half a century. Uh, then I will orient you to the project, then I will turn it over to the architect, Beatrice Hernandez of MSA Architects, who will walk through the architectural pieces. We have our entire team, our civil engineer, traffic engineer, landscape architect, everyone is on the line, so we are prepared for any questions that you might have. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff Burns, who is one of the two principals of affiliated development. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Thank you, Harvey, and, and I appreciate you guys, um, uh, you know, hearing us out today. We're, we're excited to present the project. My name is Jeff Burns. Um, I'm the uh, CEO of Affiliated Development. Um, our company is uh, based in Fort Lauderdale. We actually just recently opened an office in uh, downtown West Palm Beach. Uh, our company uh, uh, is a real estate development company. Uh, we're a little bit different than, than most developers out there in that um, our, our primary focus uh, when, when we uh, take on a new development is to accomplish two things. We're a mission-based organization, uh, and every single, every single project that we, uh, we take on is a public-private partnership. Uh, as I had mentioned, our, 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 uh, we take on any new development by trying to accomplish two things. The first is uh, to create economic development and to make investments into underserved communities. Uh, the second is uh, to address housing. Uh, as many of you probably know, South Florida is the most cost burden place in the entire country. Uh, when you look at the discrepancy of in, uh, between income and uh, rent, uh, our job is to go in and, and not just uh, put together a project um, that, that barely uh, uh, accomplishes affordability, but also one that um, delivers the high uh, uh, quality of, uh, of product that, uh, that renters have grown accustomed to over time. Our projects always are heavily amenitized. Uh, we have finishes that you would see in a project that would be getting twice as much rent as us, and, and we take a lot of pride in that. Our general contractor uh, is Moss & Associates, uh, also a Fort Lauderdale-based company. We hire uh, the best of the best and put a great project team together. 
Uh, when we start out, one of the most important things that, that we do is um, a community outreach. I can tell you with this particular project, uh, being that this project, is, as Harvey had pointed out, is in an area that hasn't seen a cons uh, really any uh, private uh, investment in a very long period of time. It was important for us that we, uh, going into somebody else's community, that we spent a considerable amount of time educating ourselves on, on the wants and the needs of this community, and also uh, you know, identifying a little bit better with some of the history um, that has, has uh, taken place that we hope to uh, incorporate into our project going forward. Uh, hence the name, uh, the Grand Theater, uh, or sorry, the, the Grand, uh, is based upon the Grand Theater, which was a uh, historic um, African-American theater uh, located uh, just adjacent to, or catty corner kind of to this site. Um, uh, again, we, we spent considerable <clears throat> time uh, uh, conducting community outreach and, uh, and working with city staff. Uh, um, Anna Maria Ponte has done a terrific job of, of continually pushing us to make sure that we uh, make this project better every step of the way. And, and uh, hopefully we've done a good job uh, in, in accomplishing that. So with that being said, I'll, I'll turn this presentation over uh, to um, uh, back to Harvey and, and we can talk a little bit more about um, uh, the project itself. Thank you, Jeff. So, just uh, let, quick, I'm sorry. Are you, is everyone seeing a full screen of the slideshow or is it just a no. part? No. I'm seeing a split screen. You have, but yeah. Yep. If you can so go to the bottom. Yeah, and hit the little. <laughs> go to the bottom right there. There. Yeah. yeah. The full screen oh, now? No. 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 Roger. <clears throat> Roger, try slideshow and then go at the very top. Go back and then go to slideshow at the top. Go to slideshow. And he, then he's to the right. Sharing his slideshow. Down. The problem is, is he has presenter view on, so you're seeing the presenter screen, not the full screen. Yeah. All right. Oh. So the other version is better than Roger. The, the one other version is better? There. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Just yeah. Make, just... make the slide larger on that side. Oh, but then you'll see. This is not a slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's better than the other one. Is that better? Yes. Because this is not a slideshow, but I'll, I can do this. Okay. You can Indeed. minimize your slides on the left as well by sliding it to the left. Yeah. There you go. Is that better? Yes. Much better. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so can we uh, go forward? Har Harvey, maybe before we continue, I can touch on just one, I think, important element I, I left off here, which is... Absolutely. Um, so um, we uh, uh, completed um, two uh, agreements uh, in partnership with both uh, HCD and the CRA to help, uh, you know, provide gap funding for the project so that we can deliver a Class A product at, at these uh, workforce, you know, attainable rents. Um, uh, both of those agreements uh, have been completed. Uh, obviously, we negotiated at length with both uh, HCD and the CRA, and uh, those agreements are, are currently in place. Uh, I'd also like to point out that um, we have further design. Uh, we spent considerable amount of, of, of money making sure that we got this thing to a point where we could get a shovel in the dirt as quickly as possible. Um, we have actually uh, preemptively submitted uh, for a building permit um, uh, just so that we can get things further along. So I, I, I wanted to say that and just that we are fully committed to not just presenting this project uh, before you and hopefully uh, getting considerable, um, you know, being able to move it forward. But, um, but our, our goal is to build it and get a shovel in the dirt. And that's very important. Um, so with that being said, I'll turn it over to Harvey. Thank you, Jeff. And I, I, I want to add to that if I could. Uh, when he refers to HCD, that is the city's housing and community development department, which has put money into this deal, as has the CRA. Um, additionally, the city of West Palm Beach police pension fund and fire pension fund have also put money into this deal. Uh, and Jeff and his partner, Nick, closed on this land with no entitlement. So talk about everyone being fully committed. Developer... Uh, bought all the land with no entitlements, and virtually every branch of the city has invested in the project. So 
uh, per uh, an agreement with the city. Jeff has already applied for his building permit. So hopefully with your approval today, they can break ground um, uh, immediately. Uh, so the location of this is between, and Roger Ramdeen, not Roger Jansen, can you make this larger full screen so they can see the detail of it? I think there's a hiccup with the slideshow. Let me do one thing really quickly. Um, I can try to share a different screen. Roger, if you if you unclick use presenter view in the screen you have, I think that works. Unclick use presenter screen. Go use, up to uh, the, the top. Ribbon, the ribbon at the to top that's showing. Yeah. Yep. Go to the I top think if and you, to the right. Yeah, in that ribbon, oh. I think that works. I think that works. Anything? And now just do presentation. Just do no, a slide show. Slide. Now. Slide show. Right. right. Does that yeah. help? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which screen are you seeing? Just make the slide on the bottom a little bit larger. So it it is just on the bottom right. Where it says the percentage, just make it a little larger. But yeah, then we cut out the that's bottom. It. Then we lose the wording. Yeah. You maximize the box at the top right. That's already maximized. What if you went back to slideshow from beginning? That wouldn't help. Harvey, yeah. I don't know about others, but I can see it fairly well. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's proceed with what we have. What I wanted to illustrate here in the site location is it's the, the project site is between Rosemary and Sapodilla on the east and west and between 2nd and 3rd Street on the north and south, but it is not a full block assemblage. There were three parcels that could not be assembled by the developer. They are the northeast corner, the northwest corner, and the southwest corner. There's also an existing alley uh, that bisects the block. Uh, the city commission has agreed uh, to uh, vacate that to the developer, actually at no cost to the developer, that goes in front of the city commission next month. So that's the general site location. Next slide, please. We are before you this morning seeking a, uh, a, a hopefully an approval of a special review of the site plan. We will also be seeking a variance uh, for the uh, uh, square footage of the cumulative unit size and uh, a recommendation on the alley abandonment that goes to city commission. Uh, we are also incidentally the next item on your agenda seeking a TDR transfer approval uh, should you approve this item. Next slide, please. So a breakdown of the project, it is 309 dwelling units broken down a third are affordable, which is the lowest uh, rental prices a third are workforce, and a third are unrestricted. So as Jeff Burns mentioned, this is intentionally a mixed income project where you will have people of all income levels living together, unsegregated, no one knows what their neighbor earns or whether they're in the building as an affordable tenant, a workforce tenant, or an unrestricted tenant. This provides, uh, a, a much better mix of a community for the building and the neighborhood. Uh, and no one knows what anyone else earns. 309 units in uh, an eight story building and a three story building, 221 bedroom units, 81 two bedroom units, eight town hall units, together with about 3,600 square feet of retail along the Rosemary Avenue frontage which historically was uh, retail. A six-story parking garage containing 410 parking spaces. And I'll now, next slide please, show you what that configuration looks like. And this is where I wish we had the full screen and I apologize for that. But to orient you, uh, Rosemary is on your right, Sapodilla on your left, second street at the bottom, third street at the top. The eight story building, which is called out at the bottom of your screen is that W shaped building that is the uh, bulk of the mass and the units, the green 
uh, on the Rosemary Avenue frontage is the retail. Uh, all of the Rosemary frontage is either occupied by retail or the lobby to the multifamily. Uh, the six story parking garage is depicted in light blue uh, on the west side of the project. Uh, the townhomes are on the north side in purple. Uh, and the three story units, which are not townhomes, but are other apartments uh, are depicted in yellow. And the project steps down as it addresses Third Street and as it addresses Sapodilla, which we'll depict and describe uh, better in the following slides. The white area in the center is the amenity package, which will be utilized by all of the tenants, whether they're in the three story or the eight story apartments or the townhomes. Next slide, please. So this is a view looking southwest. Uh, on the left of your screen is the five or six story uh, county parking garage that you've probably all utilized if you've ever served jury duty. Uh, to the right is Cityside Suites, which is uh, an existing, uh, long time existing uh, commercial building. Uh, I'll also note that that vacant area to the south between Banyan and Second uh, is also right for development. Hopefully a project will be coming through. And just to the west of that is the Flagler Station project that I think you may have already approved. So this neighborhood is going to uh, undergo uh, some dramatic and helpful improvements. Uh, you can see called out the eight story building, the parking garage, the pool courtyard amenity package, uh, the main lobby and the retail. I'll give you a minute to absorb that. And if there are no questions at this point, I'm going to turn it over from here to Beatrice Hernandez, the architect of record for the project from MSA Architects. And she's going to walk you through the architectural detail. And uh, at the, the very end, uh, should you have questions, of any of us, uh, we're delighted to try to answer them. So with that, uh, BZ, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, Harvey. Hey, Roger, can you go back to the site plan? There's just a couple of things I want to tee off before I get into the architecture. And it's more sort of about the story on this project, not so much how we're locating the massing, but really how we're addressing the street um, to the extent that we feel we've really activated sort of all sides of this block. I mean, unfortunately, as, as we mentioned, we weren't able to acquire these, these corner lots, but what we have done with the faces of the streets that we've been able to address is truly activate um, each and every single side of the project. Um, one thing that we worked really closely with um, the city on is, is sort of uh, the sensitivity to the neighborhood to the north and to the west. From a scale perspective, as Harvey mentioned, the building steps up. Um, it's starting with uh, the garage on the north side being lined with our three-story flat over flat. It's been designed, and you'll see in the architecture, to feel like a townhome product, very similar to the adjacent building that we have some exhibits that will show you in 3D, uh, similar in terms of massing. Uh, while the garage is mentioned to be six stories, the scale of it is really more five stories because the roof of that uh, parking facility or the where we're parking on the roof is not going to be covered. So we, we took great care to make sure that we kept the scale of that garage down. We worked really closely with Anna over these last few days, um, and we'll touch on that uh, with respect to the garage and how the garage looks. Even though it's tucked within an interior property line, um, the balance of the project, as you can see from this site plan, is very, very sort of activated with the residential. Uh, one thing that, that was not highlighted as much in, in this diagram is on the bottom right-hand corner um, where our lobby and our entrance is. Obviously, Rosemary is going to be our most highly trafficked street. That's where we're going to want to capture our future residents, create a much more sort of active corner. So the, the amenity space really draws you in from, from Rosemary and 2nd. We also have units that extend along 2nd Street that connect out to the sidewalk, that stoop concept that 
we've inter integrated in a lot of your downtown projects. Um, I, I worked on the, the City Place project for Broadstone. I also um, did, did a few other deals, the Lofton Place. So, you know, that, that street, stoop, pedestrian sort of concept has been carried through rather strongly here. What's, what's interesting, and I'm not sure it really exists so much in your downtown, is, is what's happening on the north side with this townhome product. We wanted to bring in those are the, the little units there that are in purple, uh, kind of a brownstone feel to the to the project on that north side, which we thought was really interesting. And what we're bringing in, in terms of style is a much more contemporary look, but we're introducing uh, sort of old old styles into the project in a much more contemporary way. When you, you know, see the windows, the window patterns, um, the use of breeze block on the project that we thought was very important to sort of bring it off um you know the, the the existing or surrounding neighborhood the the grand theater um so you know we felt that there's really no sort of unactivated spaces um on this project i mean even our service and our loading is really tucked away as much as possible so uh with the introduction of the parallel parking along second street um so we feel like we've done a really really good job of activating all sides and i'm sure anna will concur in her presentation as well so um back to the massing just to touch on on how all that looks as you can see we did um a really good job of, of taking the, the the mass of the building which is our eight-story product tucking it more to the south and then stepping the building down along the north facade or the north side of our project on third which is what you can see here with the townhomes and the three-story product and then the garage only sort of pops up a couple of stories or one and a half stories so here what you have is the the north facade this is where we we start to see the townhome product and the three-story product which is um, touching the edge of third with our eight-story building in the back and as you can see it's a very very simple elegant um, project very contemporary um, very crisp white we didn't fussy it up with a ton of color we have some pops of color that we wanted to bring in at the pedestrian level uh, we're introducing um, some tile some tile cladding on some of the stoops and you'll see it more around the lobby and the public side which is where we really wanted to enhance uh, the entry experience for for our project um, I want to come back to the garage. I want to just show you the key elements of the residential. So Roger, if you don't mind, maybe sort of going back and forth, can you jump to the next slide? So this, this top uh, view on the, on the right side of our South facade um, shows you um, that residential sort of stoop concept that we're doing. Again, we're introducing um, kind of pilasters that have these antique glaze ceramic tile cladding on those columns that you see in teal. And on the right side, the far right corner is where our lobby is. And as you can see, we treated the, the canopy um, similar to what we did at what was shown at the Grand. It has sort of that, that sort of iconic sort of signage element. That's where our building sign is going to be similar to the Grand Theater sign. And that's where uh, Jeff was talking about bringing a little bit of the historic sort of fabric into our building and constantly reminding us of of, of where we were and where we want to go. Our interiors also is going to be reflecting a lot of the history of the neighborhood, a lot of art, local historic um, uh, art and artists are going to be displayed within our lobby. So while it's not being really shown here, we want you to understand that not just the outside, but the inside is going to reflect uh, a lot of our, our respect for, for what really this neighborhood represented uh, back in the day. Um, we introduced a little bit of like, you know, contemporary scoring pattern, sort of a playful um, scoring pattern with a, a gray on gray sort of um, pattern to create a little bit of, of dynamic on the building, but we wanted to keep it very simple with the concrete frames sort of breaking up the, the roof line and um, the picket railings that we have here, which is going to be the black, black picket railings, black window frames. Um, and then the white building, uh, the garage is there. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I keep always, we always come back to the garage. Uh, th then you can see the, the rosemary facade that has what, what feels like an arcade. Um, it's got the same type of pilaster cladding that we're doing along the uh, south side for our lobby. And again, the, the entry canopy for our lobby sort of wraps the corner and here, and unfortunately you'll see it in the rendering, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to in a second, we are bringing a breeze block 
uh, design along our lobby facing Rosemary, we felt that was also an important element to integrate. And we thought it would be just a really, just a beautiful element when the sun is hitting uh, on the east side and, and casting these beautiful shadows inside the lobby. So the breeze block is, is an important element that we want to introduce at, at our entry point to the project. And, and again, the top of the building, very simple, um, varying uh, parapet roof lines, you know, continuous balconies to create sort of this very elegant streamlined uh, look on the building. And then at the ground floor, you can see floor to ceiling glass for our retail component. Um, we're still working with uh, Jeff as to what retail is going to be placed in there. We're thinking it could be a combination of maybe a little cafe, a small neighborhood sort of retail store that could support the, the neighborhood there, but we still don't know yet what may go in there. So um, back, back one slide, I want to just touch on, on the garage. We, we presented with the Historic Preservation Board last month. Um, really the portion that, that fell within their jurisdiction and some of that really had to do with the three-story building as well as a portion of the garage. And, and as you can see in Anna's um, recommendations, obviously there was some additional work that staff wanted us to do as well as historic preservation to enhance the look of the garage. While we know it's not sitting on the corner of Safadilla second and third, they still felt it really necessary for us to sort of enhance it. This is what we're proposing and I've been working with Anna on over the last few days, which is a little bit different than what's in your packet. So I hope that there's no confusion, but we did want to come and present to you. There's um, sort of the most current version of what we feel is addressing historic preservation's comments, as well as city staff's comments with respect to the conditions of approval. What we've done on this west facade of the garage, again, back to the grand, um, the, the fluting precast panel um, flanking the, the entry over the entry of the garage. We're gonna do that similar to the grand um, uh, picture. I don't know if you can go really far fast back to the picture of the grand, Roger. So you could see here, see the fluting at the center of the grand. Well, we've, what we've done is sort of anchored that fluting on the right side versus the center of the building. And at the center of the entrance of the garage, we've introduced the breeze block. So going back to the elevation, the center and to the, sort of the middle of that little vertical striping that you see, those are the fluting of the precast panels. We have the breeze block exactly area, which is similar to what we're doing at the front door, the pedestrian entrance. This is our, our vehicular entrance off of Sapadilla. And we also introduced some of the tile cladding along sort of flanking the entries of the garage, similar to what we're doing at the front door. So again, the pedestrian um, experience as well as the vehicular experience is being enhanced and it was very important for the city to, to make sure that we, we provided uh, some enhanced architecture there. Um, so this, this also reflects that. We've also introduced um, softening of the facade with a, a green wall. And the green wall is really gonna be um, like a, the ivy, the ficus that sort of grows up the precast panel. And then we've also relocated some sable palms will provide additional screening at the top floors of the garage. And then, you know, you'll see in some sketch of models too some of the existing, um, uh, his, well, I guess it's a historic building or significant building um, on the Northwest corner of the project that will be sort of in front of our garage and then the existing little house with some pretty heavy vegetation that sits on the Southwest corner. Um, on 2nd and Sapadilla. So moving to the, the next slide, I can show you some of the enhancements we did on the south facade of the garage uh, is, is creating a more residential style opening similar to the window patterns. While this garage needs to be naturally ventilated, we couldn't really enclose it in glass. Um, but what we've done is, is, is fix the proportions of the openings to make them feel more residential in scale. So it's very consistent as it flows through to the residential. Um, Anna and I have been working on that over the last um, few days. And then really introducing that green ivy wall that will be able to grow at least for at least two, 20 to 25 feet and then sporadically sort of spread up the wall. And we felt that the ground floor planting with the uh, live oaks that we are proposing along second will also provide additional screening and softening of the garage there. So that really touches on the architecture on the elevation side. I wanna just show you some of the renderings that show you what this feels like. You know, when we look at things in, in two dimension, it's hard to appreciate the, the level of, of 
you know, massing break and planar breaks that the project is, is having, however subtle it may seem, it's pretty dramatic. And you can see here in this picture, um, this is the corner entry off of um, uh, Rosemary and Second, which is our sort of iconic element. One thing that Affiliated always does on their projects is provide this uh, really interesting sort of light strip element that identifies the most iconic corner of a project or the main entry. And they always use sort of this blue neon light, which you see here in this, in this rendering. The ground will probably look, um, from a signage perspective, feel like it's, it's the old grand theater, right? And then you could see there um, the, the breeze block that we have uh, cladded on the, the right side of the facing rosemary um, for the breeze block. It, Roger, could you zoom in on that a little bit? I'm not sure if you could zoom in on the the bottom corner because I do want to show the board a little bit more detail on that. That's perfect. Um, oops, there you go. So touching on the window patterns, as you can see here, we feel that this is sort of hankering back a little bit more towards sort of the, the old retro window um, patterns that you'll, you'll see on that historic little building. We have some sketch models that'll show you that sort of the horizontal Munton patterns for the, the, the sliders that we're using on the windows, we thought was also another element that we brought into the project that touches more on the, the background of the, of the neighborhood. And then obviously at the ground floor, the same scoring pattern that you're seeing, the sort of that diagonal scoring, we're doing it with a Munton pattern of the glass. So we're carrying that through from the solid to the more the transparent um, at the entrance. So we thought that was a really elegant interpretation to, to a modern sort of look on the building. And then uh, the next rendering would be what it feels like to live inside this community. Um, we've created a really sexy pool courtyard, in my opinion, only because, you know, I conceptualized it, but I love it. Um, it, mm -hmm. it sort of is a pool that turns L-shaped and, and into the courtyard. It, the townhomes have multiple fronts. They face, um, obviously, the, the north side, but their back door is is to the pool and they have these private walkways that lead up to their units we have these fire pits the pool steps down so it's terraces down we also have in one of the other courtyards in your plan uh the idea of bringing in like an outdoor movie theater almost like um like an amphitheater and we're going to have outdoor uh movie nights there sort of similar again to the grand so we've really taken this whole grand idea in a grand way and, and brought it through throughout our community. So this shows you a little bit more about what it feels like to live inside um, the grand. And then this is a more sort of close up view of, of the townhomes uh, on the north side. And as you can see, again, those planar breaks that we thought was really important to, to bring some of the elements from the eight story down to the, the two story and three story uh, product. And we felt it creates a really nice streetscape for, for Third Street. And then this obviously is just giving you a sense of, of what this garage is going to look like from Sapadilla. And, and this just shows some, some you know, sketch up model diagrams of the improvements that we've made since we last um, submitted to you all and worked with Anna and the Historic Preservation Board to enhance on the entrance of the garage. And then this is obviously your view from the corner of Third and Sapadilla with that historic uh, building. As you can see in that window corner window pattern, you can see the sort of horizontal uh, uh, muntins that are there. That's what we went and introduced on our building. So we thought that was important to bring some, some consistency in the architecture. And then you can see that the railings are like a breeze block. So that's where our inspiration came from, is to sort of bring, bring that style and look in a much more modern way. So this is a view looking, and you can see that the garage is in the background. You're really not going to see it a lot uh, from, from this corner or this, this view. And then the last view is obviously on the south, which is, you know, that small little uh, home that's there looking um, east on second with the garage in the background again landscaping the green wall and 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 how far it's set back from Sapadilla we feel we've pretty much um, accomplished what I think staff was was concerned about which is to provide a little bit more architectural interest for that garage and again I'm just wrapping it up showing you again you know the whole project um, and how excited I am and we are 
to bring this project before you and we hope um, hope that you agree as well. So I will open it up to any questions, turn it back to Harvey to wrap it up. And I'm here for any other questions. I know I talked a lot, my apologies, but I'm really passionate about this project. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Daisy. Uh, great job. Uh, I will run through uh, the DAC standards for special review. I probably don't need to go through this in any detail with you. You know what your review standards are. We believe we comply with all of them, so I won't go through them individually. And I believe staff concurs. Happy to come back to these and discuss in detail if you wish. Next slide, please. Uh, our other request in front of you, in addition to your special review approval, is a variance. And as you well know, there are minimum unit sizes uh, and a, min a minimum cumulative average size. We do not meet the minimum cumulative average size of 800 square feet. Uh, we're at 765 square feet, which is 35 square feet below the required cumulative average. Uh, this probably has more to do with unit mix and uh, a heavy percentage of it being uh, one bedroom units. I know you've seen this issue before, part of the reason the city uh, has been more forgiving on the micro unit concept. Uh, so we are uh, in a nutshell seeking your approval to fall 35 square feet below the average unit cumulative size. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the standards of review for a variance. We believe we meet all of them. Uh, we believe staff concurs with us. Happy to come back to these if you like. And our final request is uh, a recommendation on the alley abandonment, which the city commission has already agreed uh, to provide at no cost to the developer, which is out of the ordinary. As you know, typically a uh, developer has to uh, pay full appraised value. Again, this is part of the city and CRA's investment in this project. It requires a recommendation from you to go in front of the city commission next month for a, a final approval of the alley abandonment. So what the city commission has already approved is not the abandonment itself, but the concept of uh, providing it at no cost to the developer. That was part of the funding agreement between the city and the developer, but the actual physical legal abandonment of the alley requires a recommendation from you and final approval by the city commission. Next slide, please. So we are seeking three approvals from you this morning, DAC special review, the variance, and a recommendation to the city commission on the alley abandonment. Uh, as BZ alluded to, and I probably failed to point out in the beginning, a small portion of this block is uh, subject to um, Historic Preservation Board review, which they did on December 16th. And we were fortunate to obtain unanimous approval uh, from the HPB board. Uh, final slide, please. Uh, so uh, we respectfully request uh, all of these approvals from you this morning. I'm sure that our presentation has generated some questions. So Mr. Chair, we stand uh, ready for your questions. And I wanna thank staff again, this has not been an easy process. This block is actually in three different zoning districts. I've, I've never handled a project that straddled three different zoning districts, part of which is historic, part of which isn't. In the CRA, needing alley abandonments. I mean, this had every moving part that you can imagine, uh, but we've worked through every one of them. And I attribute a lot of that to Anna Maria and Rick helping us navigate the complexities of this. And I think it's the complexities of it that it contributed to the fact that we haven't seen any real investment or development in this neighborhood for an awfully long time. Those of you who have been on this committee for a long time, uh, particularly Roger Jansen, you'll note through, you know, the original Duane Platter Zyberg version through 13 years of Zaskovich version, we've never had any activity here and uh, we finally do. Uh, so thank you to the staff for 
uh, wading through the myriad of regulatory issues with us. With that, I'll turn it back over to Roger Jansen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Harvey, and thank you, Jeff and BZ, for a nice presentation. Um, does staff have any follow-up on this or commentary that we should hear? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I have a presentation uh, okay. with the staff recommendation. I don't know if you want to ask questions now or you want me to do my presentation now. Uh, if you'd please proceed, then we'll follow up with questions. Thanks. Okay, perfect. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. So um, thank you to the applicant. Um, they did a great um, presentation with all the details of the project. So I'm not going to go through any of those details. I just want to highlight some things that were mentioned by Harvey actually at the end of the presentation and that um, point out to the complexity of this project. Um, the, the location or the site of this project, as Harvey mentioned, it is on the edge of the historic Northwest neighborhood. So it's a really um, odd uh, site that has three different zoning designation, if you can see on this slide, half of the block is NWDRC1, that is the, basically the lowest scale single family um, zoning designation. The south portion of the block is NWD2, that allows multifamily, but uh, only up to two stories. And then the front that's on Rosemary Avenue is NWD5, that allows up to five story building, makes you. So it was, a, a, to begin with, a complex uh, site uh, that was multiple zoning, difficult to develop but as one. Uh, so uh, the last year, we spent a lot of time basically going through an amendment process that the board reviewed last year, and it was finally adopted by the City Commission last September 21st through Ordinance 4904-20. We created a new uh, incentive district that allows this entire block to be designated as a new receiving site for TDRs and increase its development capacity to a maximum of 2.75 and its height to a maximum of eight stories. However, having said that, the complexity of the location of the site and the surroundings makes it uh, that the specific regulation was drafted to be sure that um, a new building in there could basically be compatible with the different surrounding and the context of each of that. And we worked very hard to be sure that the regulation that was approved uh, paid tribute to the different uh, sides of the district. Um, not to complicate further, as mentioned Harvey, this site is also includes a portion of the historic Northwest District. So this corner of the site is within the historic uh, Northwest District, and therefore the project had to go to the Historic Preservation uh, Board for approval um, and uh, obtain a certificate of conformity from the HBB Board. As Harvey mentioned, they did and obtained unanimous approval last December. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of the conditions that were introduced during the board because that affects what we're going to discuss today. Um, they uh, requested the project to update um, the corner element of the three-story units and modify the pattern that they had on the other, si other parts of the project to a fluted pattern uh, to mimic or pay tribute to the grant project. They also requested uh, the top level of the parking garage to be uh, removed to make it more compatible. So if you uh, look at this, this is the portion that was removed. So the scale, the top floor of the garage on the west, on the east side of the garage was uh, removed. So the scale and the transition towards the low scale neighborhood that is on the north side is even more smoother. So that was a very good um, process and, and we were able to work with the applicant. They um, kind of modified the parking in terms of the location and the compact, the size of the parking spaces. So they, they did not lose any parking spaces. They just kind of rearranged them. So that was a very good outcome for everybody. And then um, the last one and more prominent was the modification on the garage entrance. This is the original submittal that was presented to the HPB. So you can see the garage had just a simple screen. So working with uh, the from the recommendations for, uh, to the HPB and how they approve it, the applicant came back and basically incorporated this element that we think it's uh, very elegant. I mean, probably more than <laughs> what is needed for a parking garage, but because it's going to be highly visible from the neighborhood, uh, we thought it was appropriate to have a much um, uh, 
grandiose um, basically entrance. It has the breeze block, as Beatrice explained, the fluted pattern on either side, and then the colored tile on the bottom. So all this portion is going to be highly visible from Sabudela Avenue. So it was a very important uh, point to incorporate. So those were revisions that were done to the project based on the conditions of approval of the Historic Preservation Board. This is the elevation that you saw on the package that was submitted to the board with a discovery board. Um, so having said that, I'm going to now go through the different requests that they had. I'm not going to go into detail with the standards. We're going to just explain in general what the staff recommendation is. As Harvey mentioned, they have three requests, a special review variance and the alley abandonment. The special review in this case is required because the site is not only larger than 50,000 square feet, the site is 2.5 acres, but it's also utilizing the TDRs. Uh, as I mentioned, the project will, it's a receiving site for TDRs, and the, the site is going to receive a substantial amount of TDRs from city owned TDRs. And you're going to see after this presentation a TDR request that it will transfer the TDRs from the city owned site to this site to accomplish the development capacity that they are looking for. And they're also requesting to abandon analysis. So these three elements will make the project subject to a special review. So in terms of the special review, as uh, BZ and Harvey explained, we have been working in this for a long time and it has been a long process, but I think it has been a very successful process. We were able through uh, the regulation that was drafted originally and the uh, very good job from the architect and the applicant to create a uh, brand new project that despite its intensity of development, uh, it steps down towards the neighborhood and is highly compatible with the lowest scale of the residential neighborhood. So it, it really clearly protects uh, the historic character of the neighborhood, um, fits in the context through the stepping down of the building mass. So the variation of the building scale definitely adjusts to the surroundings with, as this explained, the three stories on the townhouses on Third Street definitely set the tone for what could happen on the north side that is also a lower scale as this one is the regulation is part of the historic district. It is compatible with the two story um, house or, or multiple family building in the corner of Capital and Second, uh, Capital and um, Third. So it fits down how the eight-story building that is the mass, the highest portion of the building on Second and Rosemary steps down towards the neighborhood. The project is also providing a brand new sidewalks, trees along the curve that create the neighborhood feeling. Uh, it, the parking garage access is located in the most appropriate um, side is access from Sapodilla and also from uh, Second Street. So we don't have any curb cuts on Rosemary, for example. That was one of the things that we wanted to avoid. Is providing additional on-street parking. That is one of the of the elements that the neighborhood requested when we met with them. Uh, some of the commercial users that are in the immediate area feel that they need additional parking. So the project is provided additional on-street parking on the area. Uh, the building design is appropriate for the neighborhood. BC went very extensively explaining how the elements that they capture in the design and we believe it was definitely successfully uh, incorporated in the project and in the in, in relationship with the context and the project complies with the private open space requirement. This um, site does not require to provide a public open uh, a space as uh, most of the other areas in the downtown because of the complexity of the site. Um, the regulation was not uh, included to require public open space. They're only required to provide private open space, which they do with the amenity uh, courtyard that they presented. So in general, we believe the project meets all the requirements of the special review standard. One of the elements that staff had concerns um, is there, it was the architectural treatment of the garage, the non-active uses for the garage. and. Um, Basically, the reason for this is uh, the, the project is, um, as BC explained, very well put together in terms of the activity around the entire site. All the frontage on 3rd Street, um, all the frontage on Rosemary, and most of the frontage on 2nd have basically ground floor units with direct access from the street, or they have the retail uses along Rosemary or the lobby. So that was very successfully done to really make a residential neighborhood project. So it is, um, it was important for us that, for example, the units on the third street provide the character of a, of a residential character. So whatever comes on the north side will fit in that and contribute to the uh, small uh, single family character. However, the elevations of the garage because of 
it is a garage is not lined. So despite they are in compliance with the active use regulation, so the code is still required to provide some architectural treatment for these elevations. So um, after we received the back package that incorporated the conditions of approval from uh, HPV that included this, that was substantial enhancement to the facade, we still believe the, uh, the treatment of the garage is still needed to be enhanced a little bit more because it is still going to be highly visible from Sapodilla and uh, Second Street. So we included a series of conditions to try to, one, uh, extend um, the, the same uh, language of the changes that were introduced uh, by the condition of the HPV into the rest of the west elevation of the garage. And also we thought maybe um, the result of that uh, was that the garage was very, very open. Um, so the cars will be highly visible from, from the exterior. So we suggested maybe close some of the panels uh, in compliance with the ventilation requirements that they have to do, but still provide maybe we suggested something like a green screen or something to hide some of the cars. Mm -hmm. That was for the west elevation. On the east elevation, on the south elevation, our recommendation was to um, work with the pattern of the openings for the garage to reflect closely the punch window pattern of the residential building. So to kind of make the relationship between the parking garage and the building closer. And if possible, incorporate also some of the um, same elements of the design of the um, HPV recommendation. So these were the recommendations that were included on in the staff report that you saw on the staff report. Since the date of the staff report, we work with the applicant on trying to make the modifications that uh, comply with the staff. And uh, since uh, last Friday till basically yesterday evening, we were kind of receiving the information from the applicant and the applicant modified the elevations to incorporate the recommendations by staff. This is the revised elevation that was submitted um, yesterday to a staff, where you can see this is the south elevation where they modify uh, the window pattern or the opening pattern of the garage to introduce more um, just punch window and introduce the green wall in one part. We believe this addresses the staff concerns and enhances uh, the design and the architectural treatment of the garage. The same way the west elevation was modified, the elements or the, the frame elements who were in, uh, proposed pre before were modified to uh, um, incorporate kind of the same pattern of the, of the garage entrance, but without the fluted because it was kind of busy. We, we tested with the architect and it looked a little bit too uh, um, congested with the fluted pattern. So uh, we work on just having the vertical elements with the transom on the top. And then they suggested to do the uh, green wall in just two panels, the ones that are most visible, the one at the corner of second, and then the one closest to the garage. It, it, this graphic doesn't have the, ga the house that is next to it is kind of fitted somehow between this area. So we think the location of the green screens in the two ends will be the, the one that achieves most of the benefit. And then the rest of the garage was the screen with the stable pumps that are located in there and they were originally proposed. So the same way with this one, we believe this addresses the staff concerns. And we think this is uh, complies with the architectural treatment requirements for uh, the non-active users. Um, uh, the second request they presented is the variance request from Article 4, Section 109 to allow the project to reduce the average unit size from the minimum 800 to the proposed 765. Staff review this request and support this request for the following reasons. I mean, this is um, something that we have seen lately in a lot of the projects and is the market trends are dictating the developers to smaller unit size. Um, in this case, uh, the applicant is doing um, an average of 765, um, but because a large portion of the project has a smaller one bedroom unit, they are, despite they are exceeding the minimum unit size that is 550, this, their smaller unit is 592. Due to the mix of the project, they are not able to reach the 800 square feet average unit size. So um, we think these, it's totally warranted for a, for a variance because this is something that it, it is dictated by the market trends. It's not something that they could modify because the project uh, finances will get into um, 
complicated numbers if the units do not make sense for the market. They're also doing something that we thought it was very interesting for the downtown. They are doing a townhouse union. That is something, it's a, a typology that is not commonly seen downtown. And we think it's going to be very beneficial for the downtown because it can attract a larger family, uh, like a, a, a family of maybe two kids and and uh, the parents that we don't have that many units for that. So the townhouse uh, typology is something very attractive and very appropriate uh, to be located on the north side of the project facing the single family residential neighborhood. So we think this is a good trade off and not compliant with the average unit size, but it's still providing some units that are atypical that provide a good, um, a different typology in the downtown that are very desirable. Also, the request is only a reduction of 4.4% of the minimum uh, required average unit size. So we think it's justifiable. The board has approved a similar request in the past for the Alexander Loft, where the units also were not meeting the average unit size. So uh, we think it's a precedent in there. Um, in addition, I think uh, um, probably staff will work um, soon in some modifications to the code to adjust this um, average unit size because we're seeing it's becoming an issue for the new market development of the project. So um, staff supports the variance request. The last request is the Ali abandonment. Um, I just want to mention that, as Harvey uh, said, the Ali, uh, the City Commission has already uh, accepted or agreed to uh, contribute the Ali abandonment as part of the financial support for the project. The Ali is a 15-foot wide Ali uh, that is prim and mainly uh, controlled by the applicant. There is only one small piece on the west side of the Ali that is this um, highlighted area on black that is adjacent to the 631 Second Street that is not part of the project and not controlled by the applicant. So when the alley is abandoned, this little piece will go to this property and the rest will be going to the, uh, the grant project. Um, the alley um, is 7,500 square feet in total and it was estimated, the value was estimated around $62,000. As it was mentioned, uh, in this case, the city accepted to contribute the, the abandonment of the alley, the vacation of the alley, as part of the financial contributions for the project. So the applicant will not be required to uh, pay uh, for the alley abandonment. It has been requested to other projects in the past. Um, staff support the request. Uh, they definitely, the alley abandonment will allow the development to go forward with uh, that the project will not be able to move forward. And the applicant has designed the project in a way that it complies with the requirements for the abandonment. So the two things that we um, look at it that are fundamental is internalizing of the trash storage. So they created a trash room uh, in the garage where the, uh, the garbage is going to be stored in there. So there's no impact um, for the area and the garbage is going to be just rolled out at the time of pickup. And also the project provides additional open space equal to the vacated alley. Um, the private open space required by the project is 25% of the lot area is 11,062 square feet. The project ha is providing an additional 8,262 square feet of private open space. That is more than 7,500 uh, 7, square feet of the alley area. So that is that uh, the project complies with those requirements. With that, we will, we rec we will recommend this to move ahead to the City Commission for uh, completion of the process. Um, that basically concludes uh, the staff analysis uh, regarding the special review by the downtown action committee um, and based on the fact that the special review satisfies all of the criteria of article 2 section 9452 staff recommends approval um, we the conditions included in the staff report have been addressed by the applicant uh, with the revised elevations presented during the meeting so we are uh, satisfied with those conditions and we don't think they need to be included in the approval or we're not recommending them with the revised elevations that will satisfy the staff uh, conditions. Regarding the variance from Article 4, Section 94.109 to reduce the average dwelling in size from 800 to 765, the staff recommends approval based on the finding that the petition meets all 10 variance standards as outlined in Article 2, Section 38.d6 of the Sonia Land Development Regulation. There's no conditions attached to this um, variance request. And the last uh, request that is regarding the uh, abandonment of the east-west alley between 2nd Street and 3rd Street, Rosemary Avenue and Zapadilla, staff recommends approval based on the finding that the petition satisfies all of the requirements of Chapter 78, Article 
not seeing the article, Article 7 of the City Code. Um, the final approval of the Ali Abandonment is subject to the City Commission, and uh, the staff is uh, scheduling that for a presentation to the City Commission on February 22nd. That uh, concludes the staff presentation, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Anna Maria. As usual, very thorough and very informative, so I appreciate it. Um, so that concludes applicant staff presentations. Do we have any comments, John, from anyone in the public on this case? I don't see where anyone has expressed interest in public comment, no. Okay, all right, then we'll close uh, the opportunity for public discussion and we'll open it up for comments from any board members, any questions of the applicant or staff. Nick, would you like to start? Sure, I just wanted to test, can everyone hear me? I had to change rooms. Yes. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, um, well, first off, I just wanted to say thank you to the developer. It's a very, very exciting project and to be kind of living downtown most of my adult life and see see a change like this in an area that has not changed, like Harvey mentioned in a very long time is very exciting. So thank you. I did have just a comment or question regarding the landscaping, particularly on the north side of the project. Anna Maria, could I get a clarification? Is this still the requirement where I have to put 20, 20 foot oak trees around or 20 foot shade trees around the perimeter of the project? Yes, they do. They have to uh, do it and they are in compliance with that requirement. Oh, great. Um, I don't recall seeing a landscape plan. I don't know if there's a, a slide that can easily be accessed to just take a look at this north facade. It seemed like in the rendering there wasn't any room for <laughs> trees, but then maybe it was just a rendering or perspective issue. Um, I, uh, BC, do you think you can pull that or Liz, can you pull that drawing from the folder? Um, I don't have access to that file, but they are providing trees. The design of the street escape basically includes um, um, a strip of landscape adjacent to the curb where they are providing trees and then a five foot sidewalk. And then the walk-up unit, the kind of the little front garden of the walk-up unit. So that will um, comply with that requirement. You give us a few minutes, maybe Liz can pull that landscape drawing from the DAX folder for the project. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and just while, while you do that, this is Beatrice. Um, the, the reason the rendering didn't show it is that those trees would have really hidden the architecture that we wanted to highlight in our presentation. So we left it off the rendering. Understood. So that's probably you know, what, what you're saying, but I have, it's LP-1, Liz, if you have access to the sheet, and it will show the, the street trees in the, in the plan. And it should be in your packet as well, sheet LP-1. LP. And then the other comment was just sort of maybe the accuracy of the size of landscape in the renderings relative to the specs. Um, some of those palms look like they were maybe you know, 50, 60 feet tall relative to the facade. So I just want to have an understanding of what those specifications are. And, you know, if that rendering is shown, you know, 15, 20 years in the future or, or uh, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, which, which rendering in particular? Was it the, the corner entry? Was it the garage sketchup models that we showed you? The garage, there was um, stable palms. Yeah, the big sable palms, and then there are some oak trees that, that really looked pretty big too. But if those are 20 footers going in, maybe that's okay. But it seemed like the palms, maybe, and one of them really seemed super tall. And I just wanted to check that. Which, those are those, the sable palms along the west side of the garage that we're relocating. Um, my understanding is that they are 20 feet right now, and they can grow up to 30. I think we show them at full grow. <laughs> Sorry, I can zoom in. Which which street is this right where? So oh, with, uh, Nick, if you if you can see in here, this is uh, on the top of the screen. You can see Third Street. So they have a strip of uh, planting area next to the curb. They are basically moving the curb to create additional on-street parking along Third Street, and yep. then um, they are doing a strip of planting area with the required uh, frontage oaks um, that they are doing. So they are putting all those ones. In planting, we're leaving a little uh, cut out between those planting areas for the path from the parking area to the sidewalk. Then they have the sidewalk and then a little um, setback for the walk-up units to have some room in there. Exactly. And the same um, section is done on 2nd Street. The Rosemary section um, does not have on-street parking, but it also has um, the planting and the trees. 
they have to be, I think, smaller trees because there are some power lines on top. L-I. Overhead power line. Crepe myrtle. Yeah, so cr crepe there myrtle. are some power lines, some um, lines that run along Rosemary. So that would be a smaller tree, so they could not be oaks. But the rest of the second and third street have live oaks. Correct. Okay, you have just, a, I guess, a detail when it comes through for the construction and building permitting. I'm assuming that this uh, tree planting would follow the same kind of detail that's been done on Clematis, where you have big trees and a very, very small green space. And I know there's some, maybe some planting detail, structural soils that Ray Carancy can yep. input. Because yep, we have the, the structural soil as a requirement of the code. So you can see in here, they are showing, I mean, this little pattern in here on the sidewalk is the areas that have the structural soil required. So uh, definitely Ray is uh, on top of that. Uh, oh, but yes, they are providing this is continuous planting, but they are providing structural soil to provide additional room for the trees to uh, grow their roots. Excellent. Correct. And then just one last question. You, you mentioned, Beatrice, the relocation of some sable palms in the aerial of the existing conditions. It seems like there's a bunch of big trees and a lot of canopy. Is there any plan for those trees either on site or for the city somewhere in the in the mix? Um, I think our landscape architect who did the, the, the disposition and the tree survey in terms of the quality of the trees, maybe he'll be able to speak better than I on this. I think her, um, or, or maybe you will know, Anna. No, well, is your landscape architect in the line? Because she has been contacted and working with um, Ray Carancy about it. I know a little bit, but not the full extent. So if she's in the line, so she can better answer. Well, yeah, this this is Herb Hodgman, the landscape architect. Hello. Hello. I guess I'll put on the camera. Here I am. Uh, yeah, that's the tree disposition plan. Um, the canopy that's existing out there that you mentioned, uh, those are not real choice type oak trees. A lot of them are exotic invasives. So we naturally take those out at the get go. And I have been working very closely with Ray Carancy as far as our interpretation of what should be removed and what should remain. Uh, his only comment was an effort to relocate, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the sable palms, which we have moved over to the west part of the site, which will help to screen and stay out of the way of construction, but it'll help to screen the west side of the garage. Oh, great. I appreciate it. Well, uh, no further comments from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, Michael, you have any questions or comments for anyone? Uh, I do. Okay. Um, so, you know, want to thank staff and the developer, just as Nick had said, you know, to, to see a project um, move into the Northwest, the historic Northwest is exciting. I, um, you know, I fully support it. Um, I, I know we have to, uh, it, I believe, you know, it meets all the requirements for the DAC special review, um, the variance for the square footage I have no issue with, the alley abandonment. Um, so very exciting. Uh, so thank you, Affiliated Development, and all the work that you had to do, as well as staff, to make this work. It sounded like it was a bit of a, more than a heavy lift. Um, I think Anna just confirm one of my questions, which is the, um, the three-story apartments are indeed walk-ups. Uh, I don't think that was actually they are. stated. They are. Um, so are there a stairwell like on each end that connects through to, how is that actually configured? I can, they, they are walk-up, the first, the ground floor is a walk-up, yeah, yes, you can Lane, but the, yes. the second and third floor are regular residential units with corridor on the back. Right, and right, and that. But at the end of, of the corridor along the three story, there is a stairwell that is ac accessed from the exterior. So they to I'd be able to access the second and third floor directly from third. They can walk up up and down the stair, and then there's also pedestrian access off third between the townhome and the three story that allows you access to the courtyard and then into the building from there. Okay, I was just trying to get an idea if it was similar to, uh, we have the city place uh, residences that have a walk up, um, just didn't know how that 
Um, it is, I think it's similar to Broughton city center, Michael, where yes. the units yeah. on the ground floor have access directly from the street, but right. the other units, you have any way a corridor behind, you can access from inside and the units above you access from the corridor. Okay. Um, as far as um, parking for the building, I, I, um, we have 410 vehicles, 309 units. Um, is this the minimum or, or is the developer, uh, is that above the minimum required parking spaces for the 309 units? Just curious. They, they have above the minimum. Um, they, I think they are at 1.3 or 1.2 something. Um, definitely above the minimum. Yeah, I think it's at 1.32. What just do you know, know offhand without doing a lot of homework? What would the minimum be? The minimum is one per only uh, per unit. On uh, even if it's if a two I mean, uh, two bedroom. Yes, in the downtown we have it, the minimum uh, requirement for uh, it's one per unit, independently of the size of the unit or the number of bedrooms. Yes. Okay, so and the then minimum... you have a requirement of one for every 20 units uh, for guest parking. Okay, so it's pretty significantly exceeds. Um, okay, I'm just curious, and I, I did talk to you earlier a little bit about the minimum biking uh, space requirements, which you explained um, on the outside was one per 100 linear feet. And then um, it, it is a relationship with the parking spaces at one per 16. Um, I, one per 15. One per 15? For 15, yeah. Okay, and they're exceeding that. Um, and they I just, are exceeding, yeah. Yeah, they're going from 20 uh, some to 30, 38, I believe you said. Yeah. Um, which I just want to give you a quick reference. I think this is just, you know, and I know there's, it's not an entirely affordable um, housing project, but there's a component of affordable housing. I just think that's a little bit of a missed opportunity um, as far as the bike storage and just Quickly, um, I live in the Prado in downtown West Palm Beach. Uh, we have 304 units, and um, we had to expand our bike storage area a few years ago as the, the space that we currently had, which fit approximately maybe 40 bikes, was overflowing. And they expanded it to um, uh, about 2,000 square feet. I measured it last night. It's about 90 by 21 feet. And there's currently 102 bicycles there and it's also now uh, actually overflowing there's there's room to get your bikes in and, in and out um, but they're actually on the outside and they're not as protected on the outside of the, the storage area which uh, we did have a uh, a few bicycles stolen recently um, so to summarize we have uh, currently in the building of 304 units um, about one bicycle per three residents I imagine if we would expand our bike storage, we would have even more bicycles yet. Um, I believe the, and this is really just, you know, I think we have to look at something. Uh, I, I don't know if there's additional space in the building at this point that we could expand that 38 spaces uh, for this project. Um, but it's a requirement, I think, uh, or a minimum that we should look at. Um, so as it sits, I think you have uh, approximately one bicycle space for each, uh, I believe I did the math, 12 units. And here in the Prado, we're at one per three. And, and um, we currently actually have one bicycle for three units. So I just think we really need to start looking at um, allowing, uh, you know, um, more space for, for people to have bicycles. I mean, here it was kind of done retroactively. Um, uh, Michael, may, may I may I uh, jump in real quick? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, one of the things we do in all of our all, all of our properties is actually we provide uh, bicycles for our residents. Uh, we we actually brand them, put our logo on them, and they're free for use for our our members. So we actually scatter those throughout the lobby. As ridiculous as that may sound, we mm -hmm. want people to be down there. We want them to grab a bike, you know, ride over to Clematis, grab a coffee, right? Um, so, and all they got to do is check them out with our, with our concierge desk. So that's one of the things that we do that might be a little bit different than some of the other developers out there. One of the other things that we found is um, uh, with our residents and a lot of our properties is some of these bicycles, um, 
are, are very, uh, can be very, very expensive. As you probably know, if you're a biker, uh, especially the mountain bikes and the road bikes, a lot of our uh, members and some of our, or a lot of our residents and some of our buildings don't feel comfortable. Uh, some of these bikes can be $1,500 and, and more if you really get into it and they don't feel comfortable leaving those out in a storage area. So even though we provide one of our assets in Fort Lauderdale, we provide actually ample storage and it's not being used because a lot of our residents just don't feel comfortable leaving a $1,500 bike out for anybody to just go and grab. So, um, so we do, you know, we, we spend quite a bit of time, uh, actually, you know, it definitely wasn't an afterthought. We, we spend quite a bit of time talking about bicycles. One of the things we always try to do in our developments, trust me, as a developer, I don't want to build parking. I hate it. It kills us. It, you know, you don't get income off of it. Um, the reality is it's necessary for financing and, and that's, there's always that balance, right. For, for us, our hope one day is, uh, to, you know, definitely, um, have a less of an emphasis on parking and, and, and automobile transportation. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we emphasize other modes such as bicycles. And, and we put, put those throughout our lobbies for our tenants to use. They get a lot of use and we love it because it's free promotion. You know, you'll, you'll go buy a coffee shop, you'll see a, a grand bike out there and, and that's what we want. So, um, so anyways, I just wanted to expand upon that a little bit and help provide some context. Yeah, that's, that's good to see. Um, and I was going to ask, actually, um, my next question was, where is the bike storage located in the building and how safe is it? Um, you know, we have yeah, our can, bikes. Yeah. Storage. You can see it on the screen. Let's put it up. It's by the, by the secondary entrance right there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, obviously or accessing it, accessing it from the, in, the garage, correct? It's not no, it's from it? the street. That's the street. No, it's that second street. Yeah, there's an entry lobby that connects you from from the second into the lobby, and then to the right is um, we'll probably have key card access to the secured bike storage there. And there's some natural light that's brought into that space. We amenitize it. It doesn't feel like like a back of house sort of storage. It's it's highly amenitized. There's going to be a workbench in there for people to work on their bikes and so on. So you can see it there. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so it's going to be very secure. Um, that's yes. that's that's good because uh, we uh, we have a, a secure storage facility here on the first floor in the Prado, and the only way to get in the storage is through when the garage door opens. There's a little slit that someone can squeeze through, and Someone squeezed through that at one point, got in wow. and stole a few bikes. So if there's a will, <laughs> someone will figure out, but that, that definitely will solve that problem being interior and having yep. uh, it accessed only through the lobby. Um, it would, I, I don't know how many bikes are provided, uh, Jeff, but. Um, you know, g g generally um, we'll, we'll have anywhere from 10 to 15 bicycles, you know, in a, in a project of, of this scale. Uh, and again, we, what, what we like to do is kind of put them, you know, kind of scatter them throughout. We, you know, our management team will go and put them out, you know, in the morning and then, you know, put them away at, at, at night. And that way we can keep track of them uh, as people uh, rent them out, you know, during the day. So, yeah, yeah, no, the Canopy Hotel is doing that as well here. And again, I think it's, yeah, great free advertising. Um, and I, again, I think uh, I spoke to Anna earlier before the meeting began, and it's just something that. Um, just like parking, and I know the city is very progressive and is doing things to uh, reduce parking requirements when, when possible. Um, I just think we need to look at that uh, minimum requirement at you know 15 to one for vehicles. It just seems like still some uh, an opportunity where we can um, change that over time and, and provide more space uh, because it, it's, it gets used. You know, the more more space you provide. For bicycle parking, I just think uh, the more people will be able to, you know, be able to buy a bike and and uh, have it secured. Um, so um, I believe just one slight question. I guess this falls more into Nick's category, but th th there is going to actually be a green wall on the south side and the west side of the parking structure. It's going to be a live green wall. It's not. Uh, yeah. Just looks like a green wall. It's, there's going to be plantings and it'll be irrigated and. It is, it is, um, I think Beatrice conf confirmed for me, but they are proposing um, the creeping fig to go on the wall. Okay. Correct. Yeah, no, I, 
I know that's a bit of a, again, a challenge to keep that alive, um, but um, that's, um, I think, a, a great treatment for the exterior and uh, will help, you know, blend the, the west side of the property. Um, so, yeah, I think that is uh, all I have. Fantastic project. Excited to see it um, move forward and see a shovel go in the ground. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Brian, do you have any comments? I, um, I do, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Anna Marie, real quick, um, just first for clarification, did you say that uh, Beatriz's uh, modifications to the garage have, have basically a limited staff condition for the west and south elevations? Yes, exactly. So what uh, they have presented those modified elevations so, that I showed to you and they show mm -hmm. will address uh, the four conditions that the staff had in the staff report. So the only condition that would remain would be B sidewalk elevation shall be maintained across driveways? Yes. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I totally forgot about that one. But yes, that one is in there. I think that is not a problem. Right, Beatrice? I mean, that I put those ones more like to have it in there because sometimes things happen during construction, but they know it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And w w which is great. Um, just want to start off. I think, uh, Jeff, you've done an, a great job working with the city. Um, you know, a workforce housing, affordable housing project, very important to the city, number one item, you know, uh, in South Florida. And uh, this type of project with that mix of units um type you know uh, unit typologies with, with the, the townhouses and uh, skewing to the smaller apartments for the affordability that's why i have no problem with the uh the, the average size of the of units not being met um i'm actually pretty impressed uh and maria you can confirm this your outreach to the community must have been pretty extensive because to have no comments whatsoever is pretty impressive Obviously, it's a good project. It's needed, and everyone recognizes that. So hopefully, uh, the outreach was positive, and it seems like this is the result of that. So that, that's fantastic. Um, um, one quick question. It's for Beatrice um, on your um, south elevation, and it's only me who really is focusing on this, and it's such a, a, a you know minute item, but I just have, I'm curious. You picked up the uh, the marquee. Uh, sort of design at the main entrance, and you picked up that marquee design um, on the south entrance um, at that south um, um, uh, Third Street lobby. Um, what's the what's the reasoning for the prefab metal cladding above it? Um, can you talk to that? Can you speak to that? What, uh, that like that copper sort of panel? Yeah, yeah. yeah it, you know if if, if we uh, showed you some of the interior uh, imagery that we were doing. Uh, for the project, which I apologize, I should have. It sort of brings a little bit of the inside out, um, sort of ties in what we're doing with the inside in terms of the material palette. So um, wanted to give that entry a little bit of a different identity to, to the main front door. And, and that's why we did what we did. Thank you. Um, and to Michael Cuevas' uh, point, um, you know, if, if biking and Ten, uh, residents having access to their bikes or having a secured location and being over park, uh, is it not possible maybe for some time in the future to be able to cage off an area in within the parking garage to allow for secure parking to add more bikes if the need arises? I'm wondering if that's something that you've seen Michael was, uh, has a sort of a hands-on experience with all of this. And the fact that you're over park might provide that flexibility, put it in the garage, cage it off and uh, give them keys and locks or however you want to do that. But if, if that need arises and those people want to have access to bikes, what you have in terms of the, the brand's bikes is fantastic. But if they have their own bikes and, you know, there's a lot of, enough of them, it, it may make sense to, to, to utilize the inside of the garage. Um, and I'm just wondering if that maybe that's a condition or something that uh, if you, you, you think about agreeing to maybe not make it a condition, but something that, that you think would arise in the future that you'd be amenable to that. And I can I can speak for Jeff, and I'm sure he would nod yes that that definitely uh, would be an option if we found that there was a big demand for additional bike storage. I absolutely was thinking of that while Michael was was talking. So, right. 
Well, thank yeah. you. Uh, great project. Uh, uh, very excited about it coming um, online in, in the uh, downtown. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Brad, do you have any comments? Um, no comments. I think it's a great project. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, how about you? Well, very brief. Um, yeah. Reiterate everyone else's comments. Great to see something like this coming forward in this area. Um, you know, particularly the townhomes, you know, the, that's a real housing typology that's missing around downtown. You know, um, probably would like to have seen more if, if we could have, but, but understand that, you know, we, you know, you can get what you get. Um, you know, would have been great too to see you, you get that north, particularly that northeast corner of the property. Um, you know, I think that would have been a good opportunity to try to maybe extend those townhomes along the street there. But, but again, you know, um, you know, we are where we are. So um, again, the residential component on Second Street, I really like that. I like the stoops. The broad stone is a great example of that. Um, those street level residential uses um, really bring a, um, you know, a, a good, you know, semi-active component to, to what can be a, a rather non-active use. So, you know, I do like that. Um, you know, other than that, I think, you know, for all of us on this meeting and on this call today, you know, um, this has got a little bit of everything that we all we all got into this game for, you know. Um, you know, as planners, this is the stuff that just gets us so excited. Multiple zoning districts, multiple regulations, all those things <laughs> to work through. So, um, that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. So, um, you know, I think it's a great project. I, I congratulate everyone. I really look forward to seeing it move forward. Yeah, great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, let's see, John Lee's not here and Gray returning. I think that anyone else that uh, didn't get a chance to comment? Okay, I'll throw in my, my two cents. Anyways, yeah, to the development team and staff, I, I think it's a fantastic project. I think in terms of the siting and massing, it's uh, extremely well done, so very successful. Just a few nitpicky architectural comments um, just to give to the design team to consider. Um, one, I'm not crazy about the gray colors. That's just my personal opinion, and maybe you could pick up a little bit on the tonality of the, the turquoise tiles that you're using, maybe with some very subtle, either the, the turquoise or blues or greens, I think it'd be a little more lively and a little less depressing than the grays. Um, number two, the, I don't think the diagonal scoring in your stucco on some of your vertical, com vertical components is helping the project at all. I, I like the notion of a, a differentiation at those panels, but maybe consider something more in a horizontal or vertical pattern that may reinforce or emphasize some of the breeze block you're using or some of the fluting. But to uh, pick up on that as a, uh, I think a more formal composition might be a better solution. Uh, three, I think the railing patterns could again, use a little work whether there's more uh, in the pattern than just the vertical pickets or horizontal, but maybe consider a different uh, patterning in there that might again help reinforce what you've done already. Uh, for the sign, we have the grand on the southeast corner. Uh, maybe it could be a little more grand. It seems a little diminutive compared to the scale of the project, so maybe it could be scaled up, but I like the, uh, the color and the lighting there. I think is very successful. And um, one question on the west facade on the upper stories above the garage, is there any fenestration on that west side? I guess a question for the architect or the or staff. I think when you're yeah, shooting you the, the west facade yeah. above the garage levels, it appeared to be a solid walls up there with uh, yes. stucco patterns. Is there any opportunity for fenestration on that upper level? There are. There are windows there. Um, we Maybe also I, have yeah. that we also have that scoring pattern there probably i've been also thinking about simplifying that too if maybe i don't know if somebody could pull it up so we can show it to roger okay i'm gonna pull it up hold on yeah. thanks anna but yes we we are providing some fenestrations similar to the window patterns that we're using on the building to provide light into those corridors as well okay i, I might yeah. have just missed it yeah it, because <laughs> Probably because the scoring pattern that you're speaking about might have um, been difficult to read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. this upper. Yeah. Oh, are those great? I mean, great? Oh, I see. Okay. These, I thought, yeah. Was, yeah. These are yeah. windows, right? Correct. Okay. Well, maybe some more windows and maybe just a continuation of what is the composition of the main block of the housing component would help it relate to that. Anyways. That's my comments, take or leave it. I've just seen a lot of this diagonal scoring and a lot of these flex mixed use projects, you know, West counties. I think it's 
not going to do a service to this project. So those are my comments. Take it or leave it. Anyone that would want to make a motion could consider those items, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Great project. Thank you. And unless there's any other discussion, we could probably entertain a motion. Motion to approve. You're going to need three separate motions, one for each of the items. Yes. Yeah, so start with the go down. Yes. The special review, then the unit size variance, and then the alley component. And please read the findings into the record as well. Yes. Um, I granting the special review. I move that downtown action committee approve the special review for DAC case number 20-09 as listed in the staff report dated January 13th, 2021. Uh, that's it. The motion is based upon a determination that the testimony presented at this hearing, along with the application submitted, constitute a preponderance of competent substantial evidence. The board hereby makes findings of fact that the special review request did satisfies all the criteria of the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations, Article 2, Section 94, 52, paren B, paren 2. Mr. Chagas, if you can please clarify that the only condition is regarding uh, the sidewalk elevation across the driveway, because they have okay. satisfied the other conditions. And I don't know if you want to include any of the recommendations from Roger, or you just want to leave those ones as suggestions. I will add in that um, uh, condition B be changed to condition A, sidewalk elevation be maintained across driveways. And uh, condition B could be added saying, the, that the architect will continue to work with staff to work on the diagonal uh, scoring element to address uh, the architectural concerns. Sounds good. Okay. Um, motion is there a second? Second. Motion second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Motion carries. Um, you want to continue with that second one then? Uh, granting a variance, I move that the Downtown Action Committee approve the variance requests included in DAC case number 20-09 as follows. A variance from Article 4, Section 94-109 to reduce the average dwelling unit size from 800 square feet to 765 square feet. This variance approval is made conditional upon the restrictions, stipulations, and or safeguards listed in the Planning Division staff report dated January 13th, 2021, that I move are necessary to ensure compliance with the purpose and intent of the zoning code and consistent with the downtown master plan and the comprehensive plan of the city of West Palm Beach. This motion is based upon the testimony presented along with the application submitted, which constitutes competent substantial evidence that the standards of section 94-38 Parens D, parens six have been met. Great. Is there a second to that? Second. second. Okay. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. None opposed. That carries. And then the third item, please, Brian. Recommending approval for the alley abandonment. I move that the Downtown Action Committee recommend approval for the abandonment of the East-West Alley located between Rosemary Avenue and Sapodilla Avenue, 3rd Street and 2nd Street, as described in the staff report for DAC case number 20-09 dated January 13, 2021. The motion is based upon a determination that the testimony presented at this hearing along with the application submitted constitute a preponderance of competent substantial evidence. The board here, the board hereby it's findings of fact that the alley abandonment requested satisfies all the criteria of the city of West Palm Beach code, chapter 78, article seven, section 78 dash 217. Perfect. Uh, is there a second to that? Second. second. A motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Non motion carries. Okay, great. Congratulations to the team, development team, design team and staff. Great project. Woohoo. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, well, so the next component of this, the TDR case 20-03, uh, Mr. Oyer, would you please continue? Yeah, certainly, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the second component to this is the transfer of TDRs. This is an eligible receiving site. The TDRs are being granted by the city from the Gateway Park site, also known as the Gumby site. 
Uh, but I do have a question for Anna Maria. I noticed that the agenda states it's a transfer of 117,844 square feet, but our presentation has 162,449. So one of the two is incorrect. So I'm hoping you can give me some help before I get started. Yes, is the the 160 something? Um, Liz, can you um, confirm the number? It's the original number listed on the agenda. Was the maximum allowed TDR to be brought to the site? Once we got the numbers from the project, this 160 something is the number that they are actually transferring. Okay, it's on page six of the staff report, Harvey. It's 162,449. Perfect. Okay, so for the benefit of the DAC members, the number recited in your agenda is not the correct number, but the staff report in our presentation is the correct number. So with that, Roger Ramdeen, do you, can you pull up the very brief presentation? If you just hit from beginning on the Left side, hopefully it begins. I can share it too. Yeah, I'm not sure why I'm having difficulty. I think it's because of my multiple screens and I'm, I, this is the screen that I can share right now. All right, uh, I'll, if you don't mind, Roger, I can, I can share okay. it. You wanna do this, go ahead, I'll stop Great. share. There you go. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, next slide please, Liz. You know the project, you know the site location that we are seeking to transfer the TDRs to. Next slide, please. So we are seeking uh, your approval of the transfer of 162,449 square feet of TDRs from 1025 Okeechobee Boulevard, which is the city-owned Gateway Park site, uh, to this site, which uh, the grand site is being designated as 623rd Street. Uh, the project complies with section 94-134 C, E, and F and qualifies for the incentive. Uh, the total project FAR is 288,824 square feet, of which 126,375 square feet is permitted by right. And uh, the difference being 162,449 that we are seeking uh, transfer of. The Gateway Park site, as you know, is a designated sending site. It currently has 247,229 square feet of TDRs available. With your approval, that number would be reduced by 162,449. Uh, uh, which would leave 81,891 square feet of TDRs on the gateway site. Next slide, please. This depicts the location of the sending site, uh, which is in front of the Marriott Hotel at Australian in Okeechobee and uh, our receiving site. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the relevant provision of section 94-134A that allows us to receive TDRs. Uh, next slide, please. The relevant section of subsection E and subsection F. Uh, with that, uh, next slide, please. Staff recommends approval of the transfer. Next slide. Our request of you is to approve the TDR transfer. Uh, that concludes our presentation. We stand ready for questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, staff, do you have a follow-up for this? Um, just yeah, just to clarify, um, I, I was going to clarify that as 162, 449 square feet. And the only condition that we have um, for these types of city-owned TDRs is that it does require city commission authorization. So we are aiming to bring that on February 22nd to commission. And that is all from me. Okay, thank you. Seems very straightforward per our typical protocol. Are there any public comments on this uh, portion of this case? Mr. Chair, I don't see any interest for public comment. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, we'll close public discussion. Any comments or questions from the board members? No, nope. uh, just one. Um, what 
does what is the remaining square footage left at the sending site for Gateway Park after this um, goes to the site? About 81,000. Okay. Uh, about oh. 82, actually. Yeah, we're, it's getting pretty low. It's uh, 81,891 square feet. And then um, I think we clarified this last time. After that remaining is depleted, then uh, people will have to buy air rights from other pro private property. Private market. Private market. Right. Mm -hmm. OK, any other questions? Motion okay. to approve. Yep. Okay, we have a motion on the table to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Can you make the finding, please, with it. the condition? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Stacey. Yeah. <laughs> Granting the transfer of development rights, I move that the Downtown Action Committee approve the transfer of development rights that case number TBR 20 03 as listed in the staff report dated January 13th, 2021, as follows. A. The transfer of 162,449 square feet from the city owned site located at 1025 Okeechobee Boulevard, Gateway Park to 623rd Street, The Grand, pursuant to the requirements of section 94-132 and section 94-134, subject to the following conditions. One, the proposed development shall obtain city commission authorization for the conveyance of city owned development rights prior to issuance of a building permit. If the site plan approval expires prior to commencement of construction, the development rights transferred by the city at no cost are forfeited and revert back to the city. Okay, so good. We have the motion reading a second. I guess there's a, uh, can someone else re-second that? Second. second. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Uh, none, motion carries, great, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. All right. Good luck, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, Anna Maria, are there any unfinished business or new business from anyone? None. Mr. None. Chair, just let the record reflect that Mr. Gabriel joined the meeting approximately 15 minutes ago. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. And, and I don't know if you want to mention, Mr. Chair, I, I think everybody may know that the Flagler Station project at the northeast corner of Banyan and Tamarin has commenced construction. This was a project that um, the DAC approved back in June of last year. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Excited about that. Yeah. Can I good. ask one question to you, Rick? Sure. Uh, just regarding um, One West Palm, which is now progressing, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I just have a uh, question regarding the whole um, uh, idea that, you know, when he pulled those cranes down that, you know, he'd have to, with, he, there's no new cranes going back up. I guess that's my question, right? He did not need to use those cranes anymore, did he? Well, I, I guess they I can say that con yeah. construction workers aren't on site yet. His intention oh, is to resume construction. Um, so well, yes, I, I think the cranes will ha probably have to go back up. Okay, because uh, I have seen I have seen people there for several weeks now. I thought they did already resume, so they uh, have not yet actually. Yeah, very very generally, Michael. I, I think what his intention is is that on a typical floor plate, he's going to subdivide them into quadrants, if you will. Um, and, and with that, you can either have office space in each, any of the four quadrants or in the outside chance that he has an opportunity to convert that to residential, it could be easily converted to residential. Um, I, I will tell the DAC that Anna and I and Liz have been working on a workforce housing incentive that we would like to bring to the DAC over the next couple months um, that would serve as an incentive. We've told Mr. Green that he has the opportunity to continue with both the Class A office project and the hotel, um, or when and if this um, workforce housing incentive is, is adopted, if he's able to utilize the incentive that we are going to be discussing with DAC in the very near future, then he has the ability to eliminate either the office or the hotel portion. But again, in order for him to achieve the 30-story height that he has now, um, he has to do two of those uses. Right now, the code allows simply the Class A office and the hotel. 
we are going to suggest a third option um, and Ann and I are working on those incentives now. We'll see that very shortly in front of the board. So that is coming. Okay. Yeah, I was just a little confused as to if it had started, if he was putting the cranes back up, because um, I had seen some activity there. And so I, I thought the whole idea maybe was he was bluffing to take the cranes down when he didn't need them anymore. But I guess we'll, we'll see them go back up. So, yep. um, and thank you for that uh, information as far as uh, the project update. Appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I will say, and I think the DAC is aware that, um, you know, if there is a positive side of COVID, as difficult as this has been and everything we've gone through, we, we have seen a tremendous influx of um, folks from the Northeast, particularly from New York because of COVID and because of the state uh, tax structure up there. Um, and again, this is something that we've been working with the Business Development Board for some time. Um, um, the 360 Rosemary project that everybody's familiar with in Rosemary Square. Um, they made the announcement recently that um, Elliott Management, a $41 billion firm, is moving into that into that office building. So we anticipate um, a few more coming in. Um, we, Ann and I are speaking with one Flagler as well, related the office building on Okeechobee and Flagler. Um, so we're hopeful that they're gonna be coming in very soon. And then this Thursday, we are bringing the tent site to our plans and plats review committee. So this board will be seeing that in, in the very near future as well. So we're seeing a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, looking around the downtown, you see all the activity that's ongoing. Um, so we really don't see it slowing down all that much. Yeah, that's great. Full steam ahead. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic. Great. Yeah, thanks for your exciting times. Um, anyone else, anything we'd like to discuss today? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, great seeing everyone and uh, good meeting. Great project. Thank you, staff. Thank you all. And uh, we'll adjourn today and see you next month. Thanks, Thank Roger. You. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. See you next month. Bye-bye.